The one and only family, let's just start with that, the Gronkowski family, specifically Chris Gronkowski, was more than kind enough to give us this opportunity. The odds of three siblings reaching the NFL are an estimated 31 million to one. My name is Chris. I'm from Dallas, Texas. Yeah. And my company is Ice Shaker. Here now with Chris Gronkowski. Oh, yeah. We're all about work this year. We're getting it done. Growing up in a family of five boys, being the shortest meant I had to be the strongest. I was out of my mind at that point. That was my skill set. Like I tore my pack off my chest. I went in there the next day saying, you know, my arm hurts, but I'm good. If we were going to fight, he was like, cool, go outside and fight. Just don't punch each other in the face and don't kick each other in the balls. That was it. You pin them down and then you just right here as hard as you can. Give a little demonstration. Uh, we're good right now. <laughs> Got him. Party on a Thursday and then go into a game Saturday and just be like, man, I'm just going to try to light up every single person I see. Who do you think is right? Flappish girl or Lake? Bros! Oh, 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 Me and my brothers, Gordy, Dan, Rob, and Glenn Gronkowski. Wow. We are, oh my God. We are the Bros! Wow. All right, everybody, welcome to episode number 48 uh, of Mislabeled. Uh, this is definitely going to be a very, very different podcast uh, than we've just come off um, with Flappers Girl. Uh, it's Sunday, August 27th. We are in Dallas, Texas, because um, we, we take things seriously over here. I know we're a little bit all over the place, but I think at the moment we've, we've moved from the Aguino crisis, and we are with um, the one and only family. Let's just start with that, the Gronkowski family, specifically Chris Gronkowski, who was more than kind enough to... to uh, give us this opportunity. First of all, Chris, how you doing? Hey, man, I just, I'm just happy I came with the right color shirt on today. I, I, it's we so did not I mean, this. You look like, like the black t-shirt Backstreet Boys. It is really funny because we all showed up to the airport at different, like together and we're like, oh God, we're never going to hear the end of this. Correct. You look like a really shitty version of the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> yeah. I completed the look, man, so I it's all good. I love it. Um, so first of all, there, there's three people here. He for sure knows the most football without even a question. I know... Yeah. Not a lot, but I know, and he knows absolutely nothing. <laughs> right. Oh, hey, hey, excuse me. Dan Marino. Dan that's Marino. Dan Marino. That's his, yeah, that's, that's where it gets. That's my go-to. <laughs> so what do you know about Dan Marino? How many, how many Super Bowls? Like three at least. Three right? Super Bowls. I'm pretty sure he had zero. Right. Oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> he won fuck. Yeah, he yeah. actually won zero. That's, I, and I Chris, was, I wasn't expecting you to go hard on me. I'll be honest. I wasn't expecting uh, questions. I thought you were going to break out some like Ace Ventura <laughs> stuff. That's why I actually asked the question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, just to get started, first of all, obviously your family, you guys are dynamic. There's no really other way to say it. It's you, three brothers, you guys no, five, all- There's five, five, man. There's five, five boys. brothers? I thought so, it was you and three others. So uh, me and four others. Who? Yeah. who four. Uh, Gordy Jr. Gordy Jr. We got, we, got, we got Dan. Yeah, the oldest brother never played football. So. Played baseball play baseball so we, we sometimes we forget about him Zach, uh, hold on stop Zach's coming in <laughs> look at this guy man he's coming in this guy knows all the he he like, he he he's like Shimon you thought you were going to be like leading this interview like he went on Wikipedia hard or yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah so we got Gordy never never played football so like it wasn't like we were this massive football family growing up like the oldest brother never even played the second oldest was just he was a beast so he was like 6'6 235 in high school so by default he was pretty much forced to play football, right? And he had an arm, so he ended up being the starting quarterback. After he played, it was me next, and I was like, man, that's like the coolest thing ever, seeing my brother play quarterback. So I immediately wanted to play football, and then uh, then we had Rob, who was just out of his mind, so he loved it, and then the youngest also played. Wow. But as a family, like, growing up, you guys were, like, always having a good time. You guys are obviously very well known for having a good time at this point for sure you guys like a band of brothers like just like yeah was, i mean it was really it's five boys one household i mean small house but yeah we all had bunk beds and we just had this neighborhood where it was like every single person in the neighborhood had a kid around our age so like and they're all boys for some reason so we just had like this massive group uh, of kids man so we we're always competing in something we always had friends over and it always ended in like this massive fight right like you were trying to fight either your brother, your brother's friends, you had to beat your brother's friends. And if you won, it was like, you had to rub it in their face, right? And if you lost, you just started fighting at that point. So wow. every day was just, it was just fights, man. All out brawls. We, first of all, where did you grow up? Uh, so Buffalo, New York. So that's, that's also kind of where, uh, you know, the party aspect comes from. You don't really have anything to do in uh, Buffalo besides, mm. you know, break, break, break some tables. 
Yeah, huge Bills fans. Huge Bills fans. Huge Bills fans. Yeah, yeah, you guys so. are, that is Bills yeah. fans are, are a tight yeah, hardcore. That, that, that explains a lot. So explains a lot. Table drops, you know, elbowing people, yeah. table, all that. I mean, that was just kind of that was part of it growing up in Buffalo. Super competitive environment. Yeah, I mean, for us, yeah, absolutely. You know, five boys, one household. I mean, we'd fight over, you know, who could eat more. Uh, then my dad throws you know, weight equipment in the basement, and it's like, who could lift more? And then we start doing, you know, different types of sports, and it's like, who can hit a further home run? You know, who could hit guys harder? You know, our game film wow. from high school is just us just trying to light guys up just so we could brag to our brother about, you know, who had the bigger hit. Do you feel like your dad actively kind of uh – push you guys to be competitive like he liked the competitiveness man i mean my dad loved it his rule was i mean if we were gonna fight he was like cool you know go outside and fight just don't punch each other in the face and don't kick each other in the balls that was it so other than that it was like if you guys have a problem go fight you know get it out whatever uh same with the neighborhood kids if they were over it was like hey they want you guys want to fight them too (laughs) like it's all good man uh so that was kind of the rules it was kind of like Everything goes except you know don't don't sit there and punch each other in the face or no nut but shots. Was he allowed. like one of those like dads you hear about like 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 a like the ball family like was he like pushing you like like my no. kids are gonna be no so sharp. if we if we wanted to play we played and that's why we never played football my dad played football he played college football my older brother never played we didn't play till high school so it wasn't like hey you guys are gonna play sports it was more like we wanted to play sports and if we wanted to play sports he helped us get better. So that was kind of his outlook. He wasn't. He was never that dad. That, that was like, outlook. Yeah, he coached us. Yeah. He always played every single kid at every position, which was pretty cool. Because now I see coaches that are like, you know, at age six, right? My kids are six now, and they're like, oh, my kid's playing first base. Like, you know, they're really he's got a bat first kind of thing. My dad always made sure that every player played every position, even if they were the best player. So uh, he was always about just like making it fair for everyone, everyone having a good time. And if you wanted to get better, he was going to help you get better. What was the What was the reason why he had every kid play the, the same uh, different all the positions was that because he didn't want to like limit them at a young age to like one thing and see if they could become better at a different position yeah i mean he just wanted to make every kid have a good experience good right experience. Got it. like even if you're not the best player on the team you still get to play Got first it. base or you still get to pitch you still get to bat first at some point just so i mean kids kids also at different times get better and, and really develop so right. my kid at five was one of the worst players on the team at six he's one of the best players so you never know when a kid's really going to get into it. You never know when a kid is, is going to get better. And if you discourage them at six years old by putting them as the last batter and making them play catcher the whole time, yeah. he might actually become a good player uh, or he could have been a good player, but he doesn't even want to play anymore at that point. Right. At what point did you realize that my, ho- I guess, hobby or the things that you were doing at a young age, obviously you guys were playing sports and all this stuff. At what point did you think, like, this could be a career for me? Like, I can do this? Man, I mean, I didn't, I didn't even think I'd be able to get a scholarship until my older brother, Dan, did. Um, so he got a, a D1 scholarship at the University of Maryland. At that point, it was like, whoa, uh, if he can do it, maybe I have a chance. He's also, you know, 6'6", six, six, you know, he's 235, 240 in high school. So right. uh, he was a specimen. So, uh, you know, at that point, it was like, maybe I have a chance. My dad was like, you better get in the weight room. You better start crushing some weights. Like, you got to really work to get to that next level. So... That's when I thought I at least had a chance to play college football. Uh, for me, that chance came two weeks left in summer. Uh, I was actually committed to go to the University of Penn. I was going to Ivy League, and my dad was super pumped about it. I wasn't as pumped because I would have left college with about 200 plus K in debt. Right. Uh, you didn't get a scholarship if you went to Ivy League. So uh, luckily, two weeks left in summer, I got a full ride uh, offered to the University of Maryland. My brother was already there. He was doing well. They were about to lose a couple guys. Uh, they were about to go on academic probation as well. Uh, so they ended up losing a couple of running backs, and they gave me a last-minute offer. So that was kind of, for me, it was kind of like, man, this is the first time I thought I actually had a chance to play at a high level. Um, and from there, That's also massive because playing University of Penn, like playing the Ivy League, Maryland, you're playing in the ACC back then? Yeah, the Division like, One ACC, like high comp. You're playing Miami. I mean, you're playing Virginia Tech. You're playing some really good schools. Right. So, and that exposure, obviously, for you is something that's massive. More than just the scholarship, that exposure playing against those players, I'm sure, is like, like, who do you remember playing against, I would say, back when you were at Maryland? Like, who do you remember playing against that's like, wow. Like, I can go back to my days and, like, obviously played in the NFL, but, like, wow, I got to play against that guy in college, and, like, I knew this guy was going to be something. Or something. Yeah, there was, there, was, there was a couple guys um, that I played with. You know, we had... We had um, Vernon Davis that was there uh, at the mm-hmm. time, so tight end that ended up going first round. Uh, we had a couple other players that uh, Sean Merriman, 
had just left, like legend, uh, like some guy, like one of those guys you didn't ever want to ever go against. Right. Uh, we had a we had a couple linebackers, uh, E.J. Henderson and his brother Aaron Henderson, that that both played in the league. So getting there, playing against them was like, man, this is this is big time. But like you said, you don't hear many guys come out of the University of Penn. Right, exactly. Uh, and go and actually get a chance at the NFL. So just being able to play at that level against such high competition allowed me at least have a chance at the next And level. when you got the scholarship, also, I just want to give the audience a little bit of a background because not everyone obviously knows football like we do. Um, you know, there are, you know, different positions of football, the things he's talking about, linebacker as a defensive position. Um, you, what position? I You played fullback in the NFL, but is that what you went for? That's the run. That's like running back on offense. Is that... Uh, what you went for at Maryland as well on scholarship? Yeah, I got there as a as a fullback. Um, so yeah, I, I fullback when I got there, ended up transferring to University of Arizona. Played a little bit of linebacker at that point. I had to sit out a year back then. You actually had to sit out when you, you transferred. transferred to Arizona from Maryland. I did, yeah, yeah. So I ended up going there. Uh, Rob came in about a semester after, and I, I played together with Rob at Arizona. Really? Did you guys run? Did like? you know that Rob was going to be where Rob became? Uh, man, he was always, I mean, talent wise, he, he was up there, you know, from day one football, he was, it was just meant for him to, to be a football player is really what it came down to. So, uh, I mean, he was already getting offers, full offers, you know, sophomore year, junior year, he had pretty much every offer, um, in the nation that he wanted, uh, besides Notre Dame, but, uh, there's a specific skill set that he has that makes him as good as he is said is hands. Is it? Uh, the quick feet, man. Just, that is it height? Yeah, at that height, like in, and it took a while for him to get kind of the coordination. But you know, when you're that big, it's hard to. I mean, it's hard to be coordinated to move to really also use your body the correct way. So if you watch him play, you'll see him run by a guy that runs a four three. You're like, how does he? How does he burn a corner right. that's running a four three when you know he might be you know running a low four six at best, right? Uh, but it's all about body position. He knows how to lean. He knows how to, you know, really run a route the correct way where he can get on top of a guy and then use his size. So, you know, you're on top of the guy, you stack him, use your size, he throws it over the top, you're open. Doesn't matter how fast the guy is. So uh, if you watch him play, he just also became a really good blocker um, in high school. He ended up transferring uh, his senior year to a school called Woodland Hills in Pennsylvania. And they threw the ball to him seven times a whole year. So uh, besides those seven passes, he blocked the entire season. Uh, with that, like he became a really good blocker. So when you watch him, and what makes him really good is that dual threat aspect of him. You know, he can block so well that you have to then stack a linebacker in there. But he could also run a route so well that the second you put a linebacker in there, he's going to run a route and he's going to burn him. So it sounds like a lot of these things are also fundamentals that he learned. Not, ju- I mean, obviously he has the skill and the talent, but like you're saying, it's not that alone, right? Uh, like a lot of it's 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 actual fundamentals. So right. uh, run blocking wise, you watch him run block. You watch him pass block. Uh, he pass blocked against Chase Young uh, and was protecting the blind side of a 42 year old quarterback uh, by himself, which you've never I've never seen another tight end go against one of the leading you know, rushers in the entire NFL one on one. Like that just doesn't happen. Right. And then shut him down. After I saw him do that, I was like, man, that's that's like that's that's next level Hall of Fame status right there for sure. But do you feel like you have a specific skill set that you do that you excel at in in football? uh it's sports wise uh mine was just man i was just i was out of my mind at that point that was my skill set right like, what do you mean i would go in there um actually like party on a thursday you know get into the meetings on friday like head down and then go into a game saturday and just be like man i'm just gonna try to light up every single person i see i think that was my skill set at that time and where did that energy come from so you basically Man, playing hungover. It was just kind of just like a that was that was that was that was college for sure. It's like doing NFL, a rager on a football field. NFL that completely stopped, but um, no, it's more just like an underdog mindset. And for me, I never thought I'd make it to the next level. So uh, I was going in there like, man, I'm just gonna. I'm just going to have a good time. I'm going to go all out, do whatever I can. Uh, and I never thought I'd even really play. So I didn't start until my junior year. Uh, had a great season, ended up uh, going into my senior season, getting hurt and then didn't have a great senior season. Went undrafted, kind of had one chance to make a team and did, so. Did you enjoy, uh, did you enjoy it when you, like as much when you started actually going for, to make it into the NFL? Like when you realized that that took away any right. bit of the joy of the game? Oh, uh, man, it's, uh, it's a good question. Right, right, you say you never expected it, so now it's more real. 
a little more no, but those, serious. Like, you have those people, yeah, like that know they're going to be in it from a young age, let's say, where their parents are really like dead set. It's like Tiger Woods' father, you know, like I was like there's the young Tiger. Gronk guy, obviously, we all know, but you know, you let that like eight year old <laughs> man. <laughs> he, I could back in internet. Sounds I could bet right now he's not going to make oh, that it. Kid. <laughs> oh, that kid, man. Really? Baby Gronk. Yeah, I mean, that's it. That's the typical. Uh, I mean, the dad's a really good marketer is kind of yeah. what it comes down to. But, right. uh, I mean, he might be an above average player. But to go from that and then make it through college, well, yeah. first make it through high school. He's not even high yeah, school. Yeah, right. So That's not growing. He's, 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 he's like barely in Pee Wee. Yeah, so he's not even there yet. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, it, the hardest thing to really, I mean, when you think about it, it's so hard to actually make it, not necessarily just because of your skill level. You know, you first have to make it through college, which you have to be smart enough to first get into college. So a lot of guys don't don't get there. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't pass the SATs or have the grades they need. Then they get into college and you actually have to go to class. You have to actually pass. You have to have to actually get through at least a year. I think it's maybe two years. You have to be at least 21. Uh, You're making me wonder right now how a lot of players are in the NFL. Here's my yeah, Wait, it, that's it, really funny to me because like, understand that. Has yeah, the SAT ruined more possible football careers than like a torn ACL? <laughs> it, I mean, it's probably close. I, I would think because. You know, you then you have to do that. You have to have your grades to qualify. Then you have to go to college and same thing. Like you have to actually have passing grades. Uh, and then from there, like this whole time, you're also avoiding injuries. Well, you know, if you right. do get hurt yeah. at that point, you can at any point, I mean, any, you blow out a shoulder, you're done. done. You know, knees done, ankle, you know, there's so many different injuries that could end your career at any point so as well. sit out like their junior season a lot of times in college. They'll literally, they'll, they'll sit out the year in order to go to the draft and people get upset at the college or the university or the athletic director or anyone else and fans. And it's like this guy's livelihood's on the line, which is also why there's insurance for draft. Like if you have a draft status in the first round, you know, top 10, 15, a lot of times you're, you, oh, have, really? you can you can insure yourself. Companies will insure your draft status and pay you out if you get injured. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. my brother had a policy. I don't, I don't, oh, he my did? dad got a policy for, for my brother. Did you ever, so. you have, did you ever have a serious injury? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, torn pec, I had pec surgery my oh, second really? season. Um, uh, ruptured my hamstring to end, kind of end my career at that point. Uh, it was either have surgery, reattach it, or just kind of let it heal, let it scar down, and not play football anymore. Uh, so that was that was when I I walked away from the game at that point. But uh, yeah, man, I mean, multiple stingers. Probably I don't know if if a concussion is truly every time you black out. I mean, it was pretty much every hit as a fullback. So that's uh, every hit you took. There was a little bit of a blackout. Yeah, yeah, I mean, head-to-head -head hit, for sure. Like a ISO in the hole. <laughs> That's Absolutely. Insane. That's insane. What are your <laughs> thoughts and feelings? Obviously, this is a huge topic. I feel like it died a little bit now, but three to five years ago, seven, when we were right. CTE. The CTE. Yeah. Yeah. This, you know, that whole saga. And uh, what's your, your take on that? I mean, it's hard to say because I, I wouldn't say, um, you know, I played all the way since high school. I had probably hundreds of blackout hits like that. And for me, like, I think it's, you know, if you keep, your mind going if you keep challenging yourself if every day you're waking up and you're learning something new and, and using your mind I, I feel like i continue to learn more and excel i mean i think with age you automatically automatically kind of lose a little bit um so i mean they've they've given me every single test possible at this point uh when i do the test i excel in all of them to the point where i'm, I'm way above average so uh it's hard to say like i don't think it's affected me but maybe in 10 years it will I want to go back to your question. Um, do you like? Did you lose the, that joy at the beginning? Because you're playing as a kid. You're playing as you're just doing free. Like right. you're, it's like a free, like free for all for you. You're like just enjoying the moment. And then when it becomes work, it's kind of like yeah. in any job. Like when that job becomes work now, you know. Um, like and it, can it maybe to real estate? Like you, you're just phone calling, hoping to hit that one deal. That was two right. deals. Okay, trying to make that money, and then you become a real broker, and you're like now. You, like it's work it's like you have to support like, your, your family now it's like it's a whole different like what what was there a change in mindset there does it change your your your, discip your disciplines yeah, absolutely man so yeah i got that all the time um people would be like man it must be like really nice playing a kid's game and making all this money uh i didn't make that much like i had a three-year contract it was 1.2 million dollars i played through it the end of that after taxes and all that like you're lucky to walk away with you know, maybe half that, right? right you have a whole TikTok account. and then you explain salaries and stuff sure. all the time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, you know, that's really what I got starting three years in the NFL. So I didn't walk away with millions in my bank account. I wasn't able to retire. You know, I had a good chunk for sure that helped me go on and, and start a business and all that. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, 
hundred percent a job. Like it's, if you're, you're one minute late, you're fine. You're fine a thousand dollars. You're probably cut too. If you're a guy like me, What's that, uh, one minute late to what? To, to practice, to a meeting, to anything one minute? out on the field. This, this fine? is the only reason I wouldn't make in the NFL. <laughs> fine. You're fine. Yeah, you're fine. Every yeah. team has that? Every team. No matter what player you are? Uh, no matter what player, man. And some guys just pay it and, and take it. And wow. a lot of guys get cut for it. Um, I've always thought about that. It's so crazy to Shmally, try, imagine trying to discipline. At the end of the day, um, I, we had uh, back in the day, Alan Vinegrad on. He was for the offensive line. So we, I asked him at the time, what's it like? You know, at the end of the day, playing with guys like Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers or anyone, you're Chris Gronkowski, they're Aaron Rodgers. Yes, you're on the same team, you have the same goal, but one of you is making 400,000, one of you is making 45 million. It's like there's a difference in that you both have to have the same commitment and you both have to have the same goal, but at the end of the day, it's like asking someone to have the same commitment as their employer, right? Like an employee to have the same commitment, like the, the wage gap. Like how do you how does like the locker room reconcile something like that? I mean, you you're always trying to get. I mean, you're you're excited for a player that gets a big contract. I mean, really, at the end of the day, like you're hoping to get there as well. So uh, really, that's a, yeah, absolutely. People are I mean, happy for teammates that get that big contract. Absolutely, man. That's bumping everyone's salaries up for the most part. I mean, if right. someone's getting a record breaking deal, you know, everyone's pay is going up. I mean, everyone's right. pretty excited about it. That's and, true. Usually you get some, hopefully get, get some gifts too out of it, man. From right. Your, from your team. Throw you a nice Rolex or something. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah, I never got one of them, but. <laughs> but it's also, more, there's still a desire to win. Like, I don't think you play, I think that there's probably a psychological profile on average of someone who makes mm -hmm. it to a professional level in sports is just a very competitive person who likes to win. And so like, yeah, his teammates making a lot more money, but I feel like you didn't get there by being someone who's like, well, I'm not that motivated to win. Like you'll, you would you would play probably just hard if you were getting paid nothing. Yeah, a lot of guys, yeah, man. Uh, a lot of other guys too are I, are definitely there just for the money, right? That's really for sure. I mean, that's a, that's a big payday, man. It's such it's just such as kind of going back to the question about you know is it still is the joy still there? I mean, it's such a stressful job, really. At the end of the day, like there's nothing even close to it. The day I stopped playing football was the day I slept in for the first time. The day I stopped grinding my teeth every single night, like. <sighs> The stress level for me, at least as a bubble player that could be cut at any time, any mm. day, uh, was Probably insane. No jumps, it's grueling, probably. I know, and I mean, it, it was. You get cut at any moment. It, if I was on the roster on a Wednesday, I was getting paid that week. If I wasn't, like, I didn't have a job anymore. So also, everything you'd you probably do, gain up, what, like five, six or more your workout every day? I every, wanted to ask you that. How much, like, you said that the amount of work all of a sudden went from having. Uh, like you thought you had potential to make it and you did that. How much work are you putting in every day? You're in the, it, it became lifting weights. Like what were you doing? I mean, off season, you know, you're going hard. I mean, you're doing two, three hours of, of lifting, uh, OTA. So like practicing with your team, um, that's off season, you're usually doing four days a week at that point. So, uh, you can take a vacation. You could go, you know, kind of chill for a couple months, but it's going to be hard to get back in shape too at least a football shape uh, if you do that. So you kind of, it's kind of your year round job to stay in shape during the actual season. I mean, you're off days of Tuesday. Uh, so, you know, you're traveling for game days or, you know, you're in a hotel for home games. Uh, you're practicing from usually you got to, if you're hurt, you're there a little bit earlier. You got to get treatment, uh, but you're usually there at 7 a.m. So 7 a.m. breakfast treatment. Uh, then you're going into meetings, going to work out two or three times a week. You're going to be out at practice, but a lot of it's also just game film, uh, learning playbooks, studying uh, as well. So usually get home um, at around five o'clock. So it's it's like a ten hour workday during the week. It's a lot. It's not just football. You're saying that's the one. Uh, that's the three people hours. just see the Sunday for yeah. three hours for sure. Yeah, that's and, crazy. And then it's just a cycle of trying to stay healthy is really what mm -hmm. it comes down to. Like that next day, you have to get up. You have to go in there. Uh, you're gonna do. You're gonna do some kind of workout and run because dude you're so stiff it's that like you can't you can't move so you have to get up and start moving just to kind of get that lactic acid the or you or are you benching at your peak uh my peak i tore my pec um man it's my second year i tackled darren sproles on a on a kickoff coverage and um on the 15 yard line and went to give like you know one of these you know kind of fist pumps and i, I couldn't really move my arm but the week before that um 
I had to stop benching after that. So the week before that, I think I was doing 385 for, for reps of six is where I was at. So that's insane. I was probably like the four high, like higher 400s. That's actually insane. That about, where was Rob? Uh, man, he's, he's, he's never been as strong, but you got to think his arms, I mean, he's five inches taller than me. So, um, his arm length, I mean, each arm is five inches longer than mine. Right. So the amount of, of weight you have to move, um, yeah, it's a lot, but he's close. He's, I mean, he, he's probably right behind me. you're me. the strongest. Yeah, for brother. sure. Yeah, I've always, I've always been uh, the strongest. I came out of high school benching. I think I had the record at 365 coming out as high a, in high school so i think i'm pretty sure i hit 385 before i left but it wasn't like a documented max so six day. reps is wild right so i was up there man but i mean bench really it's really about lower body strength you know you have to move people you have to be explosive in your lower body like being able to bench someone that never really comes into play on a right. field i was just curious but um it always looks good though so yeah, yeah for you sure gotta, you gotta have the big bench yeah yeah that's what i'm saying like for that sure. just speaks to people like how much you squat normally gives a shit yeah like, no <laughs> no it's all about it's, it's all about bench yeah. man for sure yeah do the do superstar players in the nfl at the end of the day you know everyone gets fined a thousand dollars whatever it is if they come late do they get more leeway and in and, and the and is the teams that have the bad cultures quote unquote is that the bad culture that people talk about kind of like not treating everyone equally and then you have like they say that you know bill belichick and tom brady at the end of the day and i'm sure rob would know more about this as much as like it seems like they're you know you know brothers or whatever in a certain regard or like father son or whatever at the end of the day they say that bill held tom to the exact same you know standard that he held mike frable or even someone sure. even, wait you know someone on the practice squad yeah and that's what built the culture so can you like talk into that like how much how difficult is that to try to you're trying to rein in a guy that's making 200 million dollar contract right and you're trying to equate that with a person that's making four hundred thousand. yeah for no that's that's the definition of the patriots way right there and i think that is why they were so successful so uh they did i mean he treated every player the exact same uh in new england so uh even all the way down to practice squad like practice squad on other teams that i was on uh they had the weekend off you know if it was a away game like they were done on a thursday and they were chilling mm -hmm. the rest of the weekend with the patriots they were scrimmaging on the weekends like wow. they had coaches held back they were scrimmaging uh they were ready to go they're ready to play a game but every player was held that, to that same accountability there wasn't off days which later in my brother's career hurt him i think uh every team i played on uh you know these older guys it's tough for them to recover like a younger guy so uh, to run them every day, to have them practice every day, I think is a disadvantage at some point because these guys have to recover. And that really, especially later in the Rob's career, I think that hurt him just because he's so he funny get because to that in the recovery. NBA, all you hear is rest, rest, rest to the degree that it's almost like they're a bunch of wusses. Like they, they have to rest every other day. It sounds like in a football, which is a way more grueling sport, they rest significantly less. Significantly less. There's a lot. I mean, man, basketball, they play so many games, though. Um, I hear that. So it's 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 a beatdown, man. I don't I don't I mean, I play some pickup and my knees are screaming after after two hours. I don't know how basketball players last that long. But really, you think that the rest is justified? I think so. I mean, you have to recover. You have I mean, you're not going to play to your, your best ability without getting that rest. And they're playing so many games that if they want to play at their peak performance, they have to rest, man. Uh, you know, football, you're playing once a week. So there is there is time. I mean, in practice, you're not. It's not like a game. You're not going to that that max level every single day. So, what's it there, like experiencing uh, all the Super Bowls? Like at the end of the day, Rob. Also, Rob being Tom Brady's go-to. Like, right? They're they're like boys. I would assume, unless there's something that happened that I'm totally unaware. Of. <laughs> <laughs> but are they like friends forever? Like that's just like a lock. Yeah, I, I mean, I think as the the years went on, I think they became better friends. Uh, it's not like they're like hanging out on the weekends or stuff like that. I mean, I, I personally never met Tom until a couple months ago. Really? And that was like the number one of my number one TikTok questions. Like, what's Tom Brady like? And I'm like, I truly don't know. I've never actually right. met him. Uh, you know, once that guy leaves the field, it's hard to, you know, really see him anywhere. Even you can't, after you can't go public. I was going to say, how much are, how much are, they say that you cultivate relationships in the, in the locker room and stuff how much of it is just a business relationship and how much of it like is it a real relationship yeah i mean a lot of it a lot of it's a business relationship you know you're out there you know you're with that person all day every day so you you become friends with them but really i, I mean it wasn't like you hang out with them there's a select few guys on your team that you're going to hang out with 
you'll still be friends with after you're done playing. But for the most part, you know, you're there to do a job. Mm. Do you feel like you made close friends with the NFL? Like, are some of your closest friends still guys that you made? Yeah, I mean, some of them. It was really the guys like early on that I, you know, kind of grinded with and, and made it um, on that first team with the Cowboys that I became friends with um, and still talk to today. But for the most part, I mean, 99% of the guys I don't talk to anymore. Right. It's so interesting, guess- though, that let's say, uh, let's say your brother and uh, your brother and Tom or something of that nature on other teams, right. would it just naturally be- always be boys because they're, right. they're just they're going after the same exact thing they have to both be in it like pump each other up each game like i would just think that that's an automatic bond for sure i mean they will be but it's not like to the to the point where they're calling each other like yo let's hang out let's hang out this weekend kind right, of thing. let's like all go like let's go down to the like bahamas with like, like, like camille and me, and me and tom and i guess yeah and it might and it might like, actually yeah. grow more <laughs> like now that they're both done playing they don't see each other every day you know it might become something where uh, they do start to more, and it's kind of that bond that that actually gets stronger once you're done playing. But I don't know. We'll right. see. I want to get into one well, thing. I feel, with that. I feel like it'd be it's sometimes hard for people who live like a, I mean, let's call it what it is an extraordinary life. Like most people aren't in the NFL. Like to sometimes feel um, understood by people who like worked a regular nine to five. Yeah, man. No, it's it's a really cool lifestyle, but a really challenging lifestyle at the same time. Like just to go through the airport, it's not possible. I like, was gonna ask like, you get something? Like for him, for, for I mean, like Tom can't do anything. Like that guy literally, that's why I've never seen him besides on the football well, field. Right before but, we, we started filming, you you know, you had a, a kid who wanted uh, to get a picture. They have, that's that's clearly still happening. It happens for me um, more more because of my TikTok career, to tell you that's the truth. Like, yeah, that's <laughs> honestly, you first, can you tell people what your TikTok is? Tell me, honestly. Yeah, for sure. So um, how'd you get into it in one? In 2020, pandemic hits. Uh, I start a podcast like everyone else, I feel like, in 2020, right? Yeah, it's so Got stupid it. when guys just started okay. podcast during the pandemic. Yeah, so I <laughs> started that up, and um, I had a kid on, and he came on there, and uh, he had like 600,000 followers on TikTok. And, Which kid? Ah, man, I, I can't remember. I can't actually remember his name at this point. Um, it's been three years now. But he hit me up, he came on, and um, it was kind of just like a podcast about tips and tricks and how to like kind of navigate TikTok, right? And it was blowing up at that point and no one really knew what TikTok was. So um, at the end of it, he kind of challenged me and was like, how how are you not on there? And I'm like, I am on there. And he's like, well, how's it going? I'm like, terrible. <laughs> you know, I had like 10,000 followers. It was kind of default because like, they're kind of like Instagram followers kind of thing. Right. Uh, so I posted like a hundred times, kind of the same style as TikTok. And he was like, man, like this is a different platform. You know, go on there, tell a story. You know, you have so many things that you know that no one else has known, like tell a really cool experience. So I started to do that. And first post, it, it, yeah, I threw up there. It was kind of like, boom, it was a story, you know, millions of views at that point. What was the story? Like, well, what's, what, what was it a story about? Why uh, connect so, with people? So I started hitting more like behind the scenes of like Shark Tank, NFL. Um, I told the story of like our rookie dinner with Des Bryant, where we spent over $50,000 on dinner. Uh, stuff like that, even just like breaking down my salary was one of them where right. it was like, everyone thinks an NFL player makes millions. This is how much I made as a starting fullback. Yeah, people are really Dallas Cowboys. That. For sure, like it, any, yeah. especially money involved. Like if you throw a, a number well, in there. Well, you know what's a good proof to that is that people are like obsessed with how much money like, like celebrities and like athletes make is anytime you put a celebrity's name into Google, it auto, auto like, oh, did you mean what is their net worth? Like, yeah, every we're time. so nosy, we just want to know how much money. Yeah, but also a lot of people, <laughs> most people do not make a lot of money. So they have no concept. They just see a contract and like, oh, that's so much money. They don't realize since they've never paid taxes. Taxes, uh, agent fees. Or whatever, uh, commissions and all that stuff. They don't understand that a $5 million contract is Yeah, but label, you never pay taxes yeah. either. You know, so. Yeah, we're Jewish. That, that's true. That, that was another thing. Another one that popped off was just like, people think that if you make a lot of money, you don't pay tax. So it was like, do NFL players pay tax? And it was, the answer was yes, so you actually pay. Yes. I people you, you pay. sure if NFL players pay, pay taxes? If you look it up on Google, it's one of, again, like one of those things, like the net worth thing, it will actually say like, do, if you type in like, do NFL players, it will say like, the first thing will be like, pay taxes. There's that many people, just because you hear about rich people not paying taxes, they assume that everyone who makes a lot of money knows a loophole to get out of paying taxes. So 
Uh, unfortunately, it was the exact opposite. I mean, every tax break that you could get, you phase out of because you're making so much money. And then you also have to pay in every state that you play in as well. So yeah. even though I was playing for the Cowboys, if I went to New York, I you, paid you New York taxes. Right. Is there a real... You didn't hire the right Jews, man. <laughs> yeah, that's what everyone's... That's, all, that's yeah, why dude. the post did so well, because people are like, you're an idiot. Why would you pay that much? You didn't hire the right accountant. I'm like, people hate on you for being an idiot. That, that's <laughs> that's kind of what they... they I mean, like you can't no, avoid it. There's, there's, there's no way to actually yeah. avoid that. I mean... It's not passive. Do and people actually... Because again, it's a job, it's a livelihood. How much do people factor in free agency? and things of that nature from your experience like playing for the dolphins because you don't have to pay you know income tax they definitely will Stay i mean in, especially you know? if you're going to the chargers and and i did this and my fourth year i went there um i got an injury settlement because i got hurt and they released me and it was it was 60 percent of my check that's insane was was taken out for taxes insane. it's absurd i mean it, I don't it care was what anyone tells me it's that's absurd to me. It, it was insane uh i got some of it back i mean they were taking it out at a level of you know i was going to make millions but i i didn't because i didn't play again for the rest of the year but still like if i made a lot it would have been close to 60 percent between you have i mean you have you have the state and they were taking out 13 percent for state uh, you have social security and then you also you know you have federal yeah. as well so people just think like first they only think you pay federal which isn't the case either because then you get hit by state and if you're in california you get crushed and then you also pay social security Isn't on the this first the thing we left england for yeah yeah man over? so it's uh <laughs> it's a lot through the tea over we throw, yeah, a bunch of tea into a harbor because of this but yeah it's it's a massive amount and um just because you're rich doesn't mean you get to avoid it <laughs> um just one last question on you know in this segment you know um on the rehab people just see as especially me football aficionado aficionado you just see on twitter you know Odo Beckham Jr. getting surgery, this guy getting surgery, you know, a contract, 4 for 48. Like, to us, it's kind of just like this video game of play, like fantasy football. It's honestly, like, at the end of the day, I think 99% of people that are watching football and following football are just viewing it like 2K. You know, we're not viewing it as the actual person. Talk to me about a little bit the rehab process. When you tear a 10, like, people just think you're just, you know, oh, this guy's going back in six to eight months. Adam Schefter said so, you know, and so like, okay, let's bet, like, let's bet the, you know, Patriots to win the Super Bowl. During that six to eight month period, how much of doubt and like how much of, you know, grueling, just pain that you have to go through and like to get back to your, to yourself? It, it, it's a beat down, man. So yeah, that's, uh, I mean, my pec surgery is a good example. Uh, tore my pec week six. Um, at that point, I was done for the season. Had to have surgery. Had surgery. Uh, it was six months. Like it was a six month process for me to come back from a pec surgery. So tendon was completely torn off. They have to reattach it. It's got to heal. It's got to strengthen. You have to do all the rehab to get to the level where I can go hit somebody and not worry about having to you know rip off my pec again. So there's probably also uh, a lot of anxiety, sort of interrupting that it happens. It's gonna happen again. Yeah, yeah, that. And then there's also just like for most guys, like the the worst part is kind of like the feeling that you let everyone else down. So mm -hmm. that's when guys like you hear guys that get like super depressed, like because you're sitting on the sideline, you're there and you've always been there and you're one of the best players, you know, your whole life and you've always been there to help the team. And now you can't do anything. So you just kind of feel helpless. So uh, a lot of guys really struggle at that point. Uh, and then at the same time, they fight, man, like super hard to get back on the field. So a lot of these guys come back from rehab early and you're like, man, how did that guy just come back from an ACL in six weeks? Like that's unheard of. They're there all day, every day. All they want to do is get back on the field. So these recoveries that used to take so much longer, they're cutting them down just by just well, they're probably doing grinding, like, man. Like how many hours of physical therapy a day? Insane amounts. And like to the point like they're breaking up the scar tissue. Like guys are crying on the table, getting their scar tissue broken up really? just so they can get back out there on the field. But That's dedication. Yeah, it's, it's it's all out, man. And a lot of guys, I mean, you're basically pretty much every game you're playing with some kind of injury. You know, I've seen guys with their entire leg black and blue and they're playing in the game and I'm like, man, that's 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 hardcore right there. You you mentioned the dinner with Des Bryant that cost what do you say, fifty? Yeah, we spent uh, over fifty grand for what dinner. What was that? Can you just give background on that? Yeah, so there's um this great tradition called um the rookie dinner. So uh the rookies have the honor to bring all the vets out to dinner. And, uh, what an honor. And with that, there's also the, uh, this really great honor of carrying all the, the vets' pads in at practice, right? So that was the year that uh, Des Bryant didn't carry in Roy Williams' pads. Roy asked him, hey, can you carry my pads in? He said, I'm not carrying anyone's pads in. So it became this massive story that year in Dallas that, you know, Des didn't carry the pads in. So uh, payback came in the form of shots 
at dinner that night. So uh, they ordered food, you know, everything you could think of, you know, all the best steaks, the seafood platters, uh, but it wasn't enough. The bill was only like eight grand. So they then <laughs> asked the staff for the most expensive bottle uh, of alcohol that they had. So they, they said, we have the perfect bottle for you. So uh, this bottle came out uh, when they opened it, it had its own lights on it. Uh, the guy strapped on some white gloves and he started reading the story. And the story was about this this bottle. It was actually about a rare cask of Louis the Thirteenth. Uh, they opened it up with all the other casks, but they they then tasted it and it tasted a lot better than the rest. So they let it sit for I think it was another five years, and then from that cask they created forty two bottles. Right. Out of the forty two, uh, two of them ended up in the U S. One in Vegas, of course, and then uh, the other one happened to be in Dallas at the restaurant that we were at. So um, they then measured out one ounce exactly. They couldn't They couldn't go over an ounce. They had to make sure it was perfect because it was 1750 a shot. So it thousand, was what? Thousand, out- $1,750 per shot. And um, <laughs> per, seven, shot. per shot. So there was 17 of us there. Um, they said, yeah, you know, first rounds on Des. And uh, they, they ordered 17 shots to start. So. I think that came to like 25k like right around that's like there, counting right another man's money a little bit like he, he have, literally just i think he would have taken in those pads. would he have taken in those pads still probably not on principle hey I, I don't know he might have after that dinner but um <laughs> that then they ordered a couple bottles uh like they're taking home like take home bottles of wine. a decent amount i mean he he made a decent amount of his first yeah year. he was he was a 10th round pick Do you think that catch was, he was a 10th overall pick tenth overall Do you pick, think that yeah. catch was a catch it was definitely a catch. You do think so? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, they got screwed on that for sure. It's crazy. Dallas has been poor Dallas fan. Sometimes I think it's a Romo. He was good. I still think the Packers win that game anyways because he, he it was four minutes left in that game. I think they would have been up to two or three. I still think Rodgers goes, but that was that's a story for a different time. But well, I, I wanted to actually um, ask you about. So now you kind of finding success in. So you've got the the. The you have like a water bottle company. That's it, man, right here. Hold on, let me, let me break out one yeah, of our latest so. and greatest right here, man. So it's the ice shaker. So it's a started as an insulated shaker bottle, but now full line, full line of bottles, uh, insulated bottles. Anything. I read from, that it's you guys are, you know, getting in the same arena as Yeti and like these huge. Man, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Yeti's <laughs> what the internet's saying. Absolute beast. So I mean, it's a similar product. Uh, we hit more of the health and fitness side of things. Uh, we do a lot of corporate gifting as well. So um, you'll find us in all the Lifetime Fitnesses, all the 24 hours, GNCs, the vitamin shop. So uh, Yeti's going to be more of a lifestyle brand that hits like outdoor hunting, fishing kind of oh, stuff. So, uh, and, and you're absolutely. running a, t- a pretty successful. How many followers do you have on TikTok now? Uh, so TikTok, I'm, I think I'm at like 730,000. Wow. Okay, that takes that takes time and effort. Like that we're was, in, we're in content yeah. creation. Like that takes. Took a, that's like a job. That's that was a like, job. That was like two years of posting every day, and then uh, two years of posting every day. Did you have a passion much. for it when you got into it? Like you're like you're like this is something I really enjoy, or was that you were saying in the pandemic you're kind of just like bored? It was it was a definitely it's definitely a mix of both, and it didn't take me a lot of time. I was answering questions, so right. to do content that way would take like 10 minutes easy. a day yeah, Very like, people are feeding you easy I, ability for content every yeah day. i already had the answers yeah. like it wasn't like i was researching or i wasn't even wasn't, i wasn't even to dallas i wasn't right. even cropping this stuff man i wasn't doing anything i was literally going like this reading the question literally yeah, answering the question it's just really you've just been an entertainer whole life because in it, it football players are entertainers and now you're just a TikTok celebrity. It really, it really came down to. There's two things that it was. It was storytelling, and it was, it was actually like bringing value. Like, how can I teach somebody something new? And that's right. kind of what TikTok's about. Like, it's either like a really cool, interesting story that you kind of get hooked on, and you watch the mm-hmm. whole thing, or it's some kind of value. I've learned so many things. I thought on it was there. mostly 15 year olds dancing, but I- it used to be. It was at <laughs> first, and, and if you started watching that, it will keep feeding you it. Like, you know, this guy. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, it, it gives you what you'd like to see. I can tell you that. The algorithm is a little powerful. It's pretty. It's, it is. My powerful. TikTok is that all like is... philosophy and extremely intelligent <laughs> things. That I don't know what I'm talking about. Fucking, those algorithms in general, all social medias. Yeah. TikToks is by far the it's it's the best way to test organic content. If you want to know if your content is good, just post it on TikTok. And if it goes, if it gets more views than average, it's good Our content. Content's bad. Yeah. So <laughs> that's what it means. It's, it's, it really it really comes down to and then when you really break it down, man, it is it's a hook. Uh it's it's a conflict, it's a solution. I mean you're telling a story. Like, yeah, so if you break story. down each post like that, um, 
and then you, you then you add in watch time that's how i did it as well so to really get my posts up there there's a couple of things i do i'd always ask people to ask another question so while they're sitting there asking other questions the watch time is just rolling right so they're writing their question out they're reading other people's questions they're replying back to it uh, and then i'd also the one big thing too was like actually asking for a follow so there was times where like i would go a month without asking people to actually click the follow button the next post i would say hey follow me here it was like eight to ten thousand new followers per post just by Once mentioning I, a clear call to action clear something. call to action so those were People two like told what to do two things man it really do. so that was kind of like my whole learning curve on there was tell a story bring value ask for a question so that the watch time shot through the roof as they were asking the question and then um you know from there it, it just like it would skyrocket do you network via tiktok like a lot of tiktok accounts when they get and social media accounts in general when they get to a certain place they start collabing have you done uh, collabs i, I did a little bit but i mean my tiktok game has like i, I i'm not there anymore you could do so. it without us don't worry we'll, we'll help yeah, if you, you if you need a collab I'll, yeah no, no, we'll, we'll see if we get... I'm not <laughs> yeah, we have like a, a solid 2000 well, i was gonna say we have three thousand followers there. The, the crazy thing about it though is you can have the same you can have three thousand i can have seven hundred thirty thousand if the content's good, we'll get the same amount of views eventually. Like it will hit the algorithm, we'll get the same yeah. amount of views. If the garbage, if it's if it's garbage, like I just posted, I think it has a thousand views on it from yesterday. Really? Like it doesn't uh, matter how many followers I have. If it's still trash, it doesn't matter. Like it's it's not going to get pushed. So it's got to be good content. It still oh, has to be good content. I want to go back to Ice Shaker. For yeah, a I was going to go back as well. What, what did you see in the industry that caused you to choose this over anything? Man, for me, it was really more of a, a passion for what I like doing. Um, I was still working out every day. I was going to the gym. Uh, it was it was a day like today uh, where it was just super hot you out. You the gym? You look like I you try, man. Go, I was there, man. I was there earlier. You let yourself go. But uh, I had a plastic shaker, put it down, was leaving little sweat rings, and um, took a sip. It was warm. It tasted awful. And it was just this opportunity, right? I was At that time, I was working with my wife. Been doing that for five years. We were had a very successful customization shop, uh, but it wasn't my passion. It was her passion, crushed it, made a lot of money. It was making more than my football career was making. Uh, but I just kind of always felt like I was destined to be in sports and fitness and health. And so when I thought of this idea, it was kind of like, man, this is my way out. Like this is my way to do what I love doing. Started as a side hustle in the upstairs of my house. And then uh, really it was you know shows on the weekend. Uh, I spent no money on advertising at all, but. I just learned how to do SEO by just kind of figuring out what other people were doing. So I, I jumped on Amazon. I'm like, man, why is this one ranked first? And then I go to different categories and look at theirs. I'm like, why is this one ranked first in this category? And you just kind of started to realize like, you know, the pictures, the keywords, the way people wrote things, uh, you had to do it all kind of a certain way. And pretty soon I was ranked in the top three for Shaker Bottle on Amazon. So got my sales up between shows and uh, really through Amazon and then just What's making- What sort of shows? Uh, just like bodybuilding shows, like local bodybuilding shows, and how many bottles are you selling a month? Let's say on Amazon or whatever in general. Uh, at that point, um, so I ended up getting up to uh, in the first six months, we had about eighty thousand dollars in sales. Uh, then got on Shark Tank at that point. So, so I was going to ask you, you got a deal on Shark Tank, right? We ended up getting offers from all five, and then closing a deal with Mark Cuban and Alex Rodriguez. Are you, do you have any actual connection with them since you closed the deal? How does that work? I've always wondered what happens post the deal on Shark Tank. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's been over five years now. Uh, Alex was bought out by my brother, Rob. Uh, the first time he retired, he kind of wanted to get into the business world and ended up buying Alex out of the company. So Rob's a part of it. Uh, Mark has an entire team that's built out to help out his Shark Tank companies. Uh, so he has not just Shark Tank companies, but he also invests in other companies. So he has a team called Mark Cuban Companies. Uh, in there, I have an advisor signed to me. At any time, if I have a question, uh, I can reach out to them and, and ask for advice. It's kind so of what it's it comes a system. Down to. It's a, right. I, I always wondered how they broke it down, and because he can invest in twenty companies, right. and that's aside from everything that he has going on prior to Shark Tank. Does he have any? Uh, does he have any relationship with you from it, or is that kind of just end once Shark like when uh, it's Tank? So, so yeah, for sure. I mean, if I email him right now, he'd, he'd write back in five minutes. Oh, he would. Down to, and it's not that. Yeah, he's not going to dig in deep on it, um, but he will respond. He'll make sure that if I need the help, he'll provide the help. If he can't, and he probably wouldn't help personally, he'd probably bring his team in to help me out. But uh, he's but very, is, very responsive. He's, if, absolutely, but it's not like it's not like, hey, 
you know, let me come tell you what to do or really advise you. It's, hey, I built this team out to help you. If it's a very big decision, like we're looking to sell or bring a new investment in or bring on, uh, you know, more money, more funding, like he might step in. But, more capital. But for the most part, like it's, he's here to help you live the American dream. And that's kind of, that's, that's awesome. kind of his philosophy on the show. And he's going to build out a team to help you get there. I know he seems he's like a genuine in. guy for sure. Like I know he's come into other companies that were doing weren't doing that well and actually put more money into them. We so. should get Rob and Bobby on. They should do a pod. No, but I just saw Mark Cuban. Who's that? Oh, Mark girl? Cuban did it with Bobby. You the, saw that? Yeah. So I was thinking Rob and her would be probably pretty funny. funny. You, know? you know the the new uh, the podcaster Bobby. I forgot her last name. She's, she's like a very dead Oh yeah, great. yeah. She's just with yeah. Cuban did one with her. Yeah, right. yeah. that's yeah. why I was yeah. thinking. What Rob or, and you should. That would be funny, something. man. Hilarious. Yeah, she's blowing up. Yeah, blowing up. I speak through her. I spoke yeah, the new American dream is influencer. Big, big time, man. Being yeah. Influencer. For sure. So as far as the shakers, like what's the, the plan moving forward to like really grow? Like what's the ultimate goal the company? Man, it's it's been, it's we've grown every year. So yeah, we went from that 80,000, that, that first six months, uh, got on Shark Tank, did over 3 million over the next 12 months. And we've grown ever since then. Yeah. So how much does a bottle cost? Uh, so we retail this bottle, uh, 34.99 for our, our, our most popular bottle, which is our 26 ounce shaker bottle. Got it. Where do you make, where are they from? I apologize, Zach. No, where are they from? China? Yeah, make them yeah. China? I mean, we're in the same manufacturers as, you know, we're, we're Yeti, Hydro Flask, all the big names are being made. So, uh, unfortunately, that process can't be made in the U.S. No one can make it. So, it's just one of the, the number one questions where people are like, why don't you make it in the U.S.? I'm like, I wish I could. Bro, you're in the business to make money. Not, it's, it's not probably a lot cheaper to make it in China. Uh, you just can't even, like the processes and my understanding is like you can't even manufacture a lot of things in the u.s just because of the way they're they're made what does it cost per bottle what is that like, yeah uh man for the most part like depending on it so like this design for instance going to cost more because uh it's 4d printed it's a really cool de design logo on it um if you take just our, our plain stainless bottle it's going to be significantly cheaper but no one really buys stainless anymore at this point so uh for the most part, it's a keystone markup. Everything you buy in retail is really, it costs usually a fourth of what you're paying for in the store. So you're selling it, you're doubling your money to sell it wholesale, uh, and then they're doubling their money at retail. So uh, if it's 30 bucks, like I would sell it for 15 bucks uh, to a retailer. They would then mark it up to to 30, and I would usually be getting it for like around 750. Got it. How does it keep, it. why is that keep, water cold and the ones you're using that gave you the idea that was why were those not keeping it cold so the ones we, i mean before this it was plastic there was some metal ones out there but they weren't double walled so metal itself is a conductor so if you put ice in a metal cup that's not insulated it's going to freeze your hands but uh this is actually two walls of metal uh and then on the bottom of it they suck the air out between the two walls and that's what creates that vacuum so heat and cold can't cannot transfer through an actual vacuum so uh even though there's ice in it yeah, and that, to the outside of it, you can't tell if it's hot or cold inside uh, uh, because of that vacuum this? seal. Uh, design the actual, the, I the mean. concept, it's uh, saying this is. The, I mean, the concept itself, man, was like thermos back in the day, man, with those like huge thermoses. Uh, and then Yeti made it super popular in a cup form uh, by bringing the their tumblers in. Uh, and that was kind of when I thought of the idea for this because I had the cup. It was awesome. I used it at work, but I couldn't mix or blend anything in it. So went yeah. home figured that like someone's obviously already created this right it's such a simple idea to also make a shaker bottle insulated and there's just nothing out there so a lot of people were taking like the yeti tumbler trying to put their finger over the top and like shake it there's nothing to actually yeah. blend the powder so um, oh so there's a mechanism in there that blends there is so yeah man i mean i could break down the bottle itself so handle on it we have the easy open pop top we put a finger guard on it because of the pandemic and everyone was crazy about germs uh but yeah when you twist it off it's a kitchen grade stainless steel we got measurement markings inside of it this will actually break up powders and then it twists right off so we can actually uh we have an add-on fruit infuser you can have instead this also works as a strainer though so i like it as a water bottle because you can put ice in the cup but then it clogs you know usually ice will clog the spout in a normal cup this will actually stop that from happening it will strain it in turn, a lot of people use it as almost like a cocktail shaker to party with, pour shots mm -hmm. with it. That's uh, good. Which I feel like is doing the, the Gronkowski name. Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. And then uh, it floats in the pool too. So oh, really? like, I get told this all the time, like 
I guess Yeti doesn't float in the pool or in the lake. So like <laughs> if you drop it, <laughs> it's uh, like it just happens to be that that that, that Kronk's uh, cup floats in the pool. It just it, happens it, to be it, perfect, perfect man. I, I couldn't believe it's it. Perfect for for drunken pools. So yeah, we added this silicone base on it as well. Uh, that's a, a more recent update, but really all of our stuff comes from customer feedback or the fact that I use the bottle literally all day, every day. Yeah, so one, yeah. you, you if I don't know what makes it what makes a good Absolutely. Bottle. If I don't like something, I you fix it. it. So yeah. like literally this used to fall forward and hit me in the face after a while. So we, we made it so it snaps back now. So it can't fall forward anymore. And it's just like, I always, yeah, I always wonder sometimes you use a product and you're like, this why? is a great yeah. item, but there's one fucking thing with this problem. You know, the one that thing sucks. that always like, Pringles. Everyone, you have to fucking stick your hand all the, the way inside. Yeah. Everyone has always said, I think for years, like, why don't they just have a spring at the bottom of the bottle, at the bottom of the can, that every time, of, you know, it, it, it pushes it further up, the less, you know, just the less amount of Pringles that you have. It's not the craziest concept. Because you know when you get down, like, you yeah. have, like, you get down, and you're all of a sudden your hand's just in there crunching all the chips. I have an yeah. issue with, like, peanut butter jars. Like, why don't you just make them a little bit wider and bigger and longer so that, like, I don't have to when I'm sticking a knife in there. Just right. oh, peanut yes, butter yes. coating the yeah. sides yeah. of my hand. Big things like why are they not? Yes, correct. Why are they not like? And it's so funny as an entrepreneur. Did you do you feel like I was actually home when you were just brainstorming like just ideas and like you always feel as an, like as a person just like coming up with these ideas like oh no one's done it before. There's a reason no one's done it before, and therefore like don't do it. Like is there? It's like the the shutdown defeatist mentality. It's like I was I've always thought about like you know like the fidget spinner and like these you know. Just like these ideas that just take off. This guy, for, he probably made the product, you know, just randomly one day. Maybe he's been making these small products and the thing just sells for 12 months. This guy's laid out for life, you know? And like, do you ever, did you, when you were starting with the product, when you're, were you like, okay, I can't find it, but like, there's no way no one's made this. And so like, therefore just like, I'm not even going to try it. And like, did people like around you shut you down? Like Dude, everyone shuts you down. Like no one's going to believe in you for the most part like it, it, i mean i think there's a couple of reasons for that i mean people i mean they kind of get jealous too um mm -hmm. i think like or like when you think of a good idea you know it's always kind of like you know that's never going to work kind of mentality right i don't know why people are like that but that was kind of the feedback um that i had to fight through for sure especially early on man because it never works at first like it yeah. takes a long time it's a, everything no matter how great it is like dude it's an absolute grind to actually get a sale. Like to get your first sale isn't like, hey, I'm gonna put it up on Amazon, it's gonna sell tomorrow. It's like, no right. man, like you have to make, you have to get reviews, you have to let people know about it. You have to go to a show and hand it to them and, and show them that you have to have content. Like it's, there's so much that goes into it that I didn't realize, like I was super naive and I'm glad I was because I sold three bottles the first week and it was to three friends. And like they bought them just to like, they support, to support yeah, me, support, right? Yeah. And. Uh, if I knew it was going to be that hard, I ordered 10,000 bottles. Like I was expecting like 10,000 bottles to sell in like a month. Right. Yeah. You know, I had 10,000 bottles until I got on a shark tank. Like wow. that's when I finally like sold through the, through 10,000 bottles and it was because of the show and 5 billion people watched it live. But I would have, that would have been over a year supply. What's and that I, feeling I, like when you finally hit success in that? I mean, man, that, that, that was, that was huge. But for me, like it, that wasn't like, I wasn't there yet. I mean, I, I took, it took two and a half years for me to even take a penny back from my company. And I put a lot into it. I mean, I put over a quarter million dollars into it myself and I didn't get any wow. of that money back. Two and a half years grinding all day, every day, probably over a hundred hours a week, like shows on the weekend, everything possible. And um, like my wife let me know about it every day. Like, yeah, we, when are you gonna start getting some money from this kind of thing? And we were winning, like we were successful, we were making money, but I was pouring everything back into it. So. Um, so you beat the yeah. S curve, so to speak. So yeah, I was just, yeah, yeah I was, I was yeah. trying to, it was one product, one color, one size. The first year we went over 60 products. And the next year we went over 150 different SKUs. So like- You have over 150 SKUs? 150, yeah, we probably have probably over 200 at this What's point. What's a SKU? Just, SKU is a Just a like design? different, just if, like this, Print. if there's one black, one white, that'd right. be two different design. SKUs, even though it's the same bottle. Um, so even like this this bottle alone, we have over 30 yeah, different- Yeah, you mentioned actually- Variations. Uh, the email we were, when we were going back and forth that you have you have a printing so we customize as well yeah so some, no you mentioned you have a laser like i was saying let's shoot it in in uh oh, in our warehouse yeah yeah you were mentioning your warehouse what happens there so yeah so we customize a lot of the bottles as well so um 
say a corporation is looking for a golf event, it's a good example. They're looking for corporate gifts for the golf event to put in their bag. They want them logoed, maybe a certain saying on them, something like that. Uh, they'll come to, normally it's a, a promotional company um, that they'll go to, or they might come direct to us and they'll say, hey, you know, I need 250 bottles, I want our logo on it, I need them next week kind of thing. So what I learned from my wife's business was customization. Uh, we became really good at it. A lot of times we get it out the same day. Realize if you're quick, you're efficient, and you do it right, yeah. that everyone's gonna keep coming Speed. back. So, uh, and they're gonna tell everyone else, because everyone waits to the last minute, right? And they're like, oh, I need this customized. There's no way I can get it done. Oh, yo, actually, this company can do it, and they can get it here this week. So, implemented that into Ice Shaker. We do thousands of custom bottles a week now at this point. So, um, we could do it from anything from, uh, you know, Coca-Cola is doing a, a rally for uh, their bottling company employees. You know, they needed 7,700 bottles. Uh, you know, we might have a golf event. We might have um, anything from employee gifts, customer gifts. Uh, Black Friday gifts are huge. Like, you know, spend a hundred dollars, get a free ice shaker, kind of thing. You looking to advertise in any podcast? How <laughs> <laughs> are you making deals? We've, we have, we have, man. Um, I think podcasts are a pretty solid network because. You know, when people listen, people that are listening, you know, they're all in. Like they're listening. They're, they're usually diehard fans of you if they're Absolutely. still listening. Yeah, right. yeah. The Absolutely. Community in general, you guys haven't hit it. Not in New York, that's for sure, dude. <laughs> in Mexico, we have. Mexico, we have, man. You have what? We have a, a partner in Mexico um, crushes it for us, and it's a, a he's part of a small Jewish group really? in Mexico. Yeah. Really? That's yeah. Crazy. That's crazy. He crushes, man. It's literally, like one of my questions, like, yeah. what is your what is good and bad? What's your experience been with the Jewish community? And, he's and definitely bad. about to say the bad on a public. Both, both. <laughs> man, what's the most anti-Semitic? Bro, I you've have had? so much good, bad and good. <laughs> I've, yeah, I mean that's I mean I guess from a business standpoint that's that's really I mean the only thing I can can really relate to right now is is my partner in Mexico and he just it's unbelievable man this guy called me like nonstop and said I am going to be your partner in Mexico and he flew out from Mexico to Dallas showed up at my warehouse and was like I'm going to be your partner and I'm like who the hell are you man yeah he and, saw you uh, on Shark Tank how did he saw it on Shark Tank um, his, his family had a successful like pharmaceutical company, so they knew how to import to bring in products. He already had a big warehouse. Uh, he knew how to deal with retailers as well. So like, we're if you go in Mexico, like we're like the featured bottle in Mexico. Really, like, you go wow. into like City Market, you go into um, Koppel. If you go into GNC, like you're seeing Ice Shaker, and we're kind of we like, were just there for Passover, which is like around Easter time uh, in official, Playa. Official bottle of the cartel. Yeah, man. I hope not, but <laughs> it was like a Nets front. He, you're in on all these stores. He's like the wholesaler, like to all these stores. Yeah, yeah. So he's got it in all the retailers. And in in Mexico, I mean, retail is huge. You know, you don't yes. have the online presence. Yes. Um, mm. He has it into the. He's it's official bottle of Team Mexico, like of the oh, wow. Team Mexico soccer team. Wow, that is like it's massive. That's unbelievable. And that's like comparative to like I mean right. an NFL sponsor. There. Like that's like the that's like having every NFL team. Wow. So wow. it's yeah. it's it's pretty impressive what he's done. Mm. Going back, it seems it's so funny. I think that people that don't know the Gronks, know you, know Rob, know your family, they, I think everyone just assumes you guys are these partying rager, just like everything's fun, everything's games. Don't they don't realize the discipline that it takes to get to the place that you guys get to. And we talked touched about at the beginning of the podcast, but I want you to talk a little bit more about, you know, what your parents instilled in you. You know, as you're young, because For sure. you you clearly have the discipline, but also the creativity. Like moving on from NFL life into the you know getting into the Shark Tank, you know getting into something and having that you know drive. Like we talked about a little bit, I think at the beginning of the podcast, like your your father getting you into different sports. But like talk a little bit towards the, maybe the creativity and the different things, like being able to just you know finesse your life in a way that you guys enjoy, but is also meshing with the hard work. Yeah, man, my parents did a great job of raising us. Um, my dad started a business 32 years ago. Uh, we grew up like working in that business. So I would unload the, I would unload the trucks, man. I'll carry the heavy end of the, the treadmill. So if you ever have to carry a treadmill, don't carry the side with the motor, man. It's it's ridiculously heavy. <laughs> Uh, but the one thing they did, man, was like he runs a, he runs a fitness company. Right? Yeah, so he's it's been over 32 years distributing fitness equipment. Uh, so if you're and it would be in New York, like if you're seeing like the gyms, or you're going to a Lifetime Fitness, all the equipment in there, that high end commercial grade equipment, he installs that kind of stuff. So uh, he's been doing that NFL teams, healthcare centers, high schools, all that stuff in the Northeast. He has exclusive rights for uh, for brands like Life Fitness, Precore, True, like all the big names. So. Uh, 
grew up with that. And um, I mean, my parents did a great job of just teaching us first the value of a dollar. Uh, they didn't have much. I think my dad had like sixty dollars when he married my mom. She she really? let us she let us know all about that uh, in his bank account. But uh, you know, worked six six years, two jobs, starting his own business. Uh, so it was always kind of like, hey, if you guys want it, you got to go earn it. You got to go buy it yourself. So uh, newspaper route when I was like eight as a family, all five boys newspaper route, umpiring uh, when I was twelve years old, then working for my dad when I was fifteen, delivering you know driving the truck stuff like that. So. Uh, the value of a dollar was always there. If you want something, buy it. You want a car, go buy it. You want to go to college, get a scholarship or, or pay for it kind of thing. So um, I think that was huge because a lot of people, and you might have friends like this, like when you're handed money, you don't realize how hard it is to come by it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's something I struggle with right now. No, with I my grew kids. up more privileged than you. It's very upsetting. Yeah. So, I mean, my mom sewed our socks together. Like our, everything we had was passed down. The oldest brother who was 10 years older than the youngest brother, like the youngest brother was wearing his hockey equipment. Right. You know, it was no it longer like a style. Like this is like real. So, yeah. So it was like, I mean, they didn't have much. I gotta so. ask what, your, your mom in this picture. You have no sisters, right? It's five Five dudes. boys, man. So she's just drowning in testosterone. Like, uh, insane. What, how pissed off was she just continuously or was she like, okay with it? It was just like. How exasperated was her life? She was so busy that like, I don't even think she realized like what was happening half the time. But she was she just had, working. Yeah, it was basically like she was like running a full time business. Is kind of how I can see it as like well, she, she was running your, your dad. No, I'm saying like as like thing? like raising five right. kids. Oh, oh, like, oh, oh. Like think about like yeah, that is a business. We were it was five massive kids. She had to feed us. We never went out to eat because. We couldn't afford it, and she couldn't bring us to a restaurant because we were out of control. Oh my God, you guys must so, have eaten so oh, much hamburger. Help it, it, it didn't. It didn't happen. Like we had the. That's she gave us this award. Like if we did, like we behaved well, we had good grades, and like we had a great month. We can go to Denny's and get the one ninety nine special back then, like the Grand Slam. And, and that uh, worked. It it never worked because we never behaved, and like the one, like maybe once or twice a year we get to go, and I remember like. One out of the two times we got in a fight on the way there and we had to turn around. So like we go like once a year out to eat is kind of what it I'm came down to. I just can't imagine how much wacky mag your mom has to buy to feed the five of you. She would, she would stop at like the wholesale. Dinner and, costs and like $800 like, a night. Yeah, it was uh, it was like eight eight to 10 gallons of milk uh, every time she got milk. Unbelievable. And then uh, there's the, it, it was like the huge freezer and then it was like the freezer refrigerator and these were in the garage and then there was like the yeah. freezer refrigerator. You guys are like your own little community. Yeah, it was really? wild, man. I feel like you guys had a blast though growing up. I wish I had five it's, brothers. Yeah, was man. Was it a blast? It, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know about you guys, but like I have to stay busy. Like if I'm not, if I'm bored, like I'm, I'm losing my yeah. mind. Like right. I need something Dude, to do. Dude, what's your guys like lineage from? Do you guys have like Viking blood? Man, I mean, the last name's Polish. I did get the... Um, like the ancestry. I've been to Poland. They don't make Polish. I don't. People. I've never <laughs> been there, man. I don't know what's going on over there. <laughs> Something but else is in there, man. <laughs> like, it was like eighteen percent Polish, and then like a mix of Eastern European. Whatever. Thirty percent bear. Yeah, I, man. So I don't know. I've never been. Now that you've obviously, we are in a different generation than when you grew up, or even when we grew up. So here's my question: You got four now? You told me four I got kids? four kids. Yeah, four kids. Are they doing paper routes at eight years old? No, not, right? no. That has but changed. There's, so. I mean, the, the big thing I did, and um, I guess I'd recommend doing this as well. Like, my kids were going on Amazon and just like they're buying whatever they wanted. Like they oh, figured out, like, swipe. Yeah, yeah, like they, that they figured out. Damaged your, it did. Damaged your it bank. did damage. It did like it was like two hundred dollars in damage, right? And like these packages kept showing up at my front porch, and I'm like, what? What is going on? And my wife's freaking out about it, right? And so finally it got to the point she disabled, like it was on his iPad or whatever, and she disabled it, but came to the point where they then like expected, like, you know, you just swipe and like things show up and like, there's right. no, you know, you don't have to pay for it. There's no real consequence. And your kids are young, right? They're young. They're so five. They're just and, buying you know, the dumbest shit. Bro. Yeah. Just like, like fidget spinners. All that stuff. Like, like 20 at a time. Like, a, like the gun, like the Nerf guns and everything. Mm. So it's all just showing up. And uh, it came to the point where we said, hey, if you guys want something, you have to pay for it got them a wallet they had money from their birthdays and you know from the holidays stuff like that so uh the first thing they bought they bought like i don't know these dinosaurs it was 20 bucks i pulled out the 20 bucks out of his wallet put it in my wallet and i said there you go you can have it so they got it they used them they broke them all they were gone in like a week whatever and then they said they wanted to buy more i said grab your wallet and they said now we're good and i was like all right there we go so literally just for making them purchase their first gift themselves 
after that, they realize like this isn't going to last forever, and they've never asked to buy anything again off Amazon. Wow. So it just that's good. Your pretty, son's going to turn eight. You're going to be like time to get a Roth IRA. Man, I mean, <laughs> it's time, I, it, it was a good. I mean, super early on, just a good way to stop that from really manifesting. And yeah, I, I know, like even as a kid, like when we'd walk through the aisles, we'd always try to get the candy bars, right? And try to get my mom to, to buy them yeah. for us. And she, she Baseball said no, cards, yeah. said uh, no every single time. So I uh, was kind of the same way now, like same thing. Like it's so annoying. They start crying. Like once you have kids, man, I don't know if any of you guys have kids, but uh, once you have kids and they start doing that every single time you go shopping, it is the most frustrating thing in the world. So it's like, all right, you want it, bring your wallet next time and bam, it's over with. Yeah, we don't have kids and we cannot relate to what you're talking about at all. So, It'll come, so. man. One day you're going to be <laughs> like, and nephews, I, I, I remember this podcast. Relate. Relate. Not not relate. No, really. You're going to give your kid a wallet at age one. I was going to say that I, I happens to be, I think that nowadays you could give over the same, uh, the same character lessons. I'm trying to use to find the right words, but to your children. But they just going to look much different. Life lessons, but they're just going to look much different. Like, you're not going to make your kid go do a paper route. Like, that wouldn't be realistic. Right. You're going to take $20 out right. of his wallet exactly. when he swipes $20 right. on Amazon. But I also think it's a little more humane. <laughs> like, <laughs> I also right. imagine. Uh, I hear people like, sorry, you, but you hear people like, when back I was in the day, up, I, like, I, I had to I, bike like four miles. Yeah, and I know someone who literally told me that he would go collect all the bottles and put them and retrieve five cents for a bottle. Yeah, we did and that I was too. Just like, bro, that's that's child abuse to me. Like, like I don't know. You're, you're I poor. did that for sure. I did that. I'm sorry, sorry, Man. Mr. Gronkowski. Our I'm Gronkowski. Man, I'm not knocking you. Yeah, our neighbors across the street would have these big parties, and then like they give us all the cans and be all these cigarette butts in it, and we have to clean them and like oh, go bring God. them back for five cents and. Yeah, we did that, man. Well, speaking about that generational gap, I imagine that your kid, how old, how old your oldest? Uh, six, six years yeah, old. Yeah, he's getting close to that age. Like, I imagine he is, he thinks it's probably way cooler. He's much more proud that you have a TikTok following than that you were in the NFL. Yeah, man, it, it, it's YouTube is what it is. Like, if you're on YouTube, like, you are the coolest person. Really? Ever. That's what really? we have right YouTube's now. YouTube's cool to get? Oh, you I thought TikTok not, is like God. Nice. No, um, I, I think my kids are too young. I, mean, I, th I mean, these kids live on YouTube, and YouTube. it just... You it might just, be Jewish, by the way, I'm realizing. You have four kids under six years old? Yeah, yeah. It's, oh, yeah, that is crazy. crazy. You're probably Jewish. Well, actually, are, you, yeah. are you? Are you uh, religious? Uh, I mean, we grew up uh, Catholic, but it's not like... Really, what it came down to was it was impossible for my mom to bring us to church. So that's when it. That's <laughs> you when you're a lab Catholic because oh, yeah. she's gonna get you in the car to go. So like we never went to church. Be I mean we did like like um like I, I guess uh, religion like religion classes growing up yeah, sure. and and then that was kind of it. But as a family, like going on a Sunday to church was just it was just never. Did happening. you always want like a big family? That was always something you wanted. Uh, man, I mean to me it was kind of. I was cool with whatever. It's kind of up to the wife at that point. <laughs> You're cool with what? I mean, I wanted, I we'll wanted, make at, as least, many I wanted at least. Do you know how hard fatherhood would be, though? <laughs> no, I mean, I don't no, know, but I would just man, like. No one knows, man. It like, and you really, when it comes down to it, like you have your first kid, you have no clue what to do. Like, girls, I feel like they like, I don't know, they research it or like their friends all <laughs> tell them or what. Maybe. Or like this instinct or whatever. But for a guy, like, you have no idea. Like it hits you, and you're like, like I don't know. I have no clue. Like when do I feed this baby? Like, <laughs> yeah, like no, no <laughs> idea, man. Thing. Like no clue. Literally. So like the first one, you're just like completely clueless, and you, you almost feel to the point where like you should be required to take a class. Like there I should mean, be. We like, really should. It's like a coach. Like I, I coach football now, and like they make you do a coach's clinic. They make you get like uh, you have to get a background check. You got to get CPR certified. You know, you have to take all these class. I had to take three hours of classes just to become a, a certified coach. I'm like, man, like I almost feel like a guy should have to do that for having a kid, man. Cause like, you don't know anything, man. Yeah, I'm a, you know I nothing. a therapist that one time told me that you need no PhD to do the hardest job in the world. Like you need no schooling, no nothing. And you're about to take a kid and you know, it's, bring it's, it into the world. You don't need anything. All you gotta do is have sex and have a kid, and bam! Like, you don't, you know. So yeah, people need a. We gotta, we gotta start a company. Brush up, man. Like, Come there's on, books. There's, there's, there should be something, right? We start like a. What's the online like a Udemy for like having kids? Like we pay like, ninety nine dollars to like. You need like pray your university for fatherhood. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing there's got to be like something out there, right? There's, there's, there's probably a free course. Out I mean, out they there have like take. those those classes, like when like the when the wife's pregnant, the mommy and me class. Right? Yeah, mommy and me, like the girlfriend's pregnant. Like they have those things. Um, it's very sexist. They don't have it for men. 
Yeah, I think the man can come along. I think dad classes has a nice ring to it. Just dad yeah, classes. Dad classes. Daddy clinics. Daddy, <laughs> Daddy <laughs> clinics. Daddy clinics is a weirder vibe to it, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be an investor in that, in that kind of dad, dad classes. You'll get, or Daddy I, I get us on Shark Tank. Uh, yeah, I can, yeah, man, I can see it on there. I can see the pitch. Uh-huh. I can see the yeah, pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see it, man. We were thinking, what is it? <laughs> Do you know, did you get to know A-Rod? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there, A-Rod... For the most part, um, I mean, the thing with him was that he didn't have that same team. He didn't have that same experience. He was a guest on the show, so it was kind of right. just like all over the place, right? Uh, so Mark was nine seasons in at that point. Right. So uh, he had it down. He knew what to do. He had the team built out. He knew kind of how it was going to run. So he was gonna a big so, yeah, I was going to say, and he had, more and real he, estate. And he had no product, so like that's exactly right. it. So like he didn't understand like what what it takes to do retail yeah so he was like well, can we stuff. make can we make a custom bottle and like release it next week i'm like Dude. that's gonna take me three to four months to make a custom bottle with like he wanted to do an a rod bottle which would have been pretty cool yeah uh, that like, the, like cool. the pinstripes on it and like it was oh, it yeah, was a pretty yeah. cool yeah. design but that's he wanted cool. to release it in like a week and i was like man like i gotta go like get this made like it's right. i can't, I can't release this works. next week so um yeah, and then you know Rob became super interested, and that was the first time he retired and wanted to be a part of it. So it just made sense. Are you guys really close, you and Rob, like brother, like real deal? Close yeah, or? I mean, I would say all five of us are You're. are really close. So I mean, we're talking, you know. Usually talking to at least one of my brothers on a daily basis. What does that family chat look like? Do you? Have- <laughs> oh yeah, the meme for sure. Man, yeah, I mean. I'm not a fan of the group chats. Like, yeah. so we're, we're not really in a group chat together, but it's kind of like each brother, what's cool is like, we all do something different, but we all are kind of in similar type of businesses. So uh, with my dad in fitness, like it crosses over a lot with what I do. So if they're selling to a gym, I could also sell to a gym. Right. Uh, if I'm selling to a certain customer, like they might also have an interest in fitness equipment. Cause it's, it's all so, ancillary. It's all it's so similar. Who's the, and who's the funniest brother? The funniest man, I mean, Rob, for sure. Like these, he's never, he's never changed. He's always been like that and always pushing things to the limit. Yeah. I was going to say, getting back to like, um, just give us a couple of funny things. You were there at university of Arizona with him, man. You two, give us just one story, just one good story. I mean, the the craziest thing involving involving you where you're, yeah. Yeah. The craziest thing was like the oldest brother was there too. So he was playing at that time, the angels organization, he was drafted late rounds and, um, they they practiced in Arizona. So it was kind of like this thing, like he's gonna stay with us and be kind of like our mentor. Well, he really became like, you know, the guy with a car that also had some money that could buy kegs. So <laughs> he kind of just like became an all out party because the oldest brother was there. So- um, And you all liked the party. There was, there's no Gronkowski that's like not a party. No, so we like, the first thing we did was we, we put all our money together. We bought a hot tub in the back of the house. Amazing. It wasn't like, it was supposed to be cleared by the city. Like we didn't oh, clear anything. Amazing. Uh, the guy who sold it to us did the electric for it. Like, I don't even know like how he did it. Like, <laughs> it's probably like 100% illegal, but it worked. And uh, it's we used to like have these big parties, and it got to the point where like every party you had to do keg stands, and of course you had to like try to do one-handed keg stands, and then you had to try to do like push-ups while doing keg stands, and like who could do the most. And of course the whole entire floor was just soaked with beer, right? So we would then take soap and just like spray soap on the floor because you know, that would clean it, right? So spray it and then realize, you know, a couple minutes later that it was super slippery and people kept falling. So at that point, just uh, thought it was a great idea to then run as fast as you could and, and dive through it and just like start a slip and slide. Uh, so that then became like, you know, let's, let's throw on some like ridiculous outfits and dive through it and like slip and slide and see who could go from the front door out the back door. And uh, then once we got out the back door, then we start jumping in the hot tub and by the end of the night, like the entire hot tub and the whole backyard was like bubbles, just completely full of bubbles. <laughs> the creativity is wild. So I just, it just kept evolving um, until like my brother, oldest brother had like the, uh, like a man thong on with handcuffs on it. No idea where it came from. <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the police knock on the door. <laughs> and that was like, everyone just mad scramble. Like, you know, what, what do we do at this point? And uh, just, Everyone kind of just locked it down. Oldest brother has to open the door. He's got freaking 
uh, this man thong out with handcuffs on it, and we're like, no way, it's just right like now. a chest. And that's that was it, man. Like that was the last time we did slip and slide through the house. But that was kind of a good story. That, story. Was, that was kind of what it was like, man, back in college. That's amazing. And then you have to, and then like, and then like the next day you have to get up for like two a day practices. Yeah, it was, and they it was all crazy. Have to be successful somehow. <laughs> and you got, that's crazy. Yeah, you could only do that in college though, like. Once you got like past twenty, man, like you couldn't do that anymore. Right? Yeah, if you if you party like your that, body says, yeah, yeah. Body there's no chance. Recover. It just doesn't. No. So, so like now, yeah. we, we were just talking like, about it, this. We're like we're young. Like we're all twenty nine, and it's not that uh, young anymore. It, I'm just saying it's not that young. But like when we were twenty four, it's funny you're talking about it, like me and me and and label had a house on on the water, and it was uh it was a lot of fun. We had a hot tub in the back. We threw a lot of parties. It was a good Slip time. And slide. We I didn't do a slip. We didn't do a slip inside, but we, we got evicted eventually. We got evicted. We got evicted from the house, so we did a good job. Um, nice. But yeah, <laughs> but um, no, I I still remember the first time we got evicted was because the landlord. His wife came by. What do you mean the first time you got evicted? No, not the first you, time. I was like, got... well, we, but when she fired, <laughs> when she came over, it all started basically because she heard that there was a party in the house, so she came over. And I'll never forget. We were together. I don't know if you remember. We were this, all we were all in the city. She came right, but she came the next morning. She wanted to see the house, and we threw like this rager, and there was like a balcony in the front of the house, like in Long Beach, <laughs> New York, looking over, and. My, our friend like has this thing he calls it Manny Juice because his last name is Manny so he just has this cocktail that just gets people fucked up and it tastes like it's lemonade like but it's just this crazy cocktail anyways he made like a ton of it and everyone drank it like totally unprepared like these random people that were just showing up at the party did not realize what was happening and within like a half hour like a solid 150 175 people were just lights out and they there were people on this balcony that were just literally puking off the balcony now <laughs> literally so we cleaned it up in the front but this the landlord's wife came and there was one like just big ass splotch of throw up on the left side of the balcony that someone puked off the side of the house that i missed <laughs> she showed up and she's like what she went crazy she was like this italian woman and she like 50 year old woman and she went absolute ape shit she walks in the house you have throw up coming off the balcony <laughs> just like we also had cleaned up like 150 beer cans like we had someone go there and clean up like 150 beer cans that were just yeah. laying around but he left one one bunk. one it wasn't a bunk it was a little bowl oh. a little bowl it didn't even have anything in it and it was a person that we didn't know that like we had just met for the first time and he by mistake left it in their backyard and she went crazy the top of the cooler or whatever oh my god was... anyways just going back to it we were talking about it you were saying like you just don't have the ability you, your body just doesn't recover like i notice now like when i was 24 even at that time we i was able to have 15 20 shots in a night you know throwing beers and i'm waking up the next day okay i'm waking up a little late maybe i'm a little late for work waking up at 10 and 11 instead of nine but like i'm fine by the still next functionable night. still functional yeah now if i go out and i have you, you know if i go ham like if you go out on a saturday night i'm done for sunday and i'm done for, like monday i'm at work i am like not functional and like tuesday finally like your body is like back it's crazy like once you start like every year in your 20s i feel like it just you know, it's like one shot less that you can have. Tell Rob at this point of his life, and you will do. Uh, I'll, I'll go right at you guys. Don't worry, I got, I got both of you. <laughs> go shot for shot. Shot for shot. Yeah. Let's go. I'm all my money's on it. And not just that, I will. I will be down for that. I will die for a solid two weeks time. A shot for shot. <laughs> yes, Rob. yes. I will be. I'm fine going to the hospital. <laughs> you, that's what it would be, man. We'd be good that night. <laughs> just be the next two days. Uh, do, you, do, you ever right. still, do you ever play pickup football? Pick up football. I'm. Uh, you just I'm, play the I'm, game. You, no, I'm what? currently the um, the QB coach for my six year old team. So really, but what's that <laughs> look exactly like? What does that look That's, like? <laughs> it's mayhem. I am like, sure your six year old is better at sports than I. He's 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 pretty good, but like the problem with you sports, like knowing how much you know as an athlete that played at the highest level, right. is you go in there thinking that you're going to teach these kids all this stuff. Yeah, like fundamentals of like yeah, how to know. like you know. You like, your body and I'm like, going to teach know. him how to run a route, get on top of the route, how to plant his foot, how to cut out. And like, you're not teaching him any of that. The wide There's receiver zero. just beat himself. Like it's a yeah. different game. <laughs> There's, it's a different game. There's zero chance. not you're, an elite level. <laughs> after, after the first practice, I went and bought 50 cones because I can't even get the kids to stand in the right spot. Like you have to get a cone and be like, Everyone go stand at a cone. In a way, it's got to be like more challenging than an NFL practice. Like you're, it, you're, it's tough, like it's man. It's got to be frustrating. So like I went into it like I'm, they never pay the fines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you sign up and One you're like, dollar, please. One my dollar. team's gonna be amazing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, teach them so much. And then like 
after the first practice, you're like, man, I gotta like, I gotta teach him one thing at a time. And like, if we know three plays by the by the first game, like, right. that's a success yeah. at this point. So it's tough. All right, all right. Um, we're, we are running out of time here, I believe. Um, first of all, Chris, I really want to say thank you. I appreciate um, people it. People ask me, by the way, how I get guests, and for those wondering, it's for great people like you. Or honestly, you're just a nice, kind person. I called you, picked up. Let's do this. Let's make it happen. That was impressive, man. That, that was an impressive phone you. call. I appreciate it. Thank now, you. I think that is that's a skill, man. Thank you. That almost nobody would do. So I appreciate it greatly. Truly, great, thank you. Great work. Um, but honestly, it takes a good person. It takes two to tango, and you yeah. kind of made it happen. And, here we are, and I honestly really enjoyed this. this yeah, awesome. this is great. great combo. This is really awesome. Hope um, you enjoyed it as well. A lot of fun. Last question, Tim Couch. What are your thoughts <laughs> on the Browns? <laughs> We're from Cleveland, so <laughs> you just won't. He's the last like, quarterback from Cleveland. I don't even know who that is, man. <laughs> you got Whatever, you. I have more sports knowledge here. It's fine. Um, this guy knows everything. <laughs> number one pick from 1999. Yeah, All that's right, right. guys. Um, <laughs> do, you don't watch anymore. You said football, right? I know. I still watch. I'm just. I'm not just. I'm not hardcore like, following it who's, at this point. Who's your go-to before I let man, you? Man, right now, I mean, I, I've been. I've been cheering for the Bills to win a Super Bowl. Man, I went back to the roots. You know, brothers, that sounds like oh, I not missed that at the beginning of the, the conversation. Players? No, you're a Bills fan, but Rob played for the Patriots. Yeah, and won Super Bowls and. Rob and Tom, I think, went like twenty-eight and four against the Bills <laughs> over the course of like, yeah. like Tom went like twenty. Like Rob probably went like twelve and two. Those, those were his. Whatever it is. He had the, the, his best games against the Bills. He'd be at like three, four touchdown yeah, games. Bills, and, what's the famous? He's had some famous plays. What's the famous play where I? I'm trying to remember the last Super Bowl. I think it was where he, it was. What was it the last Super Bowl? Where I just remember. Oh, the one. Where, and, I, like a huge, huge pass where he picked what? it. It was, it was third or fourth. And the game would have been over, and he literally like right he threw them, and he, the, th those hands I still remember so clearly. Yeah, those things are monsters. No, but the fact that he has the hands to be able to grab the ball at the size that he is, and yeah, I, he's, I, I, it's just incredible. I don't know, but um, no, I was just wondering. I was saying if there's any player right now that you're just like wowed by, like this guy's on, like is it Mahomes? You're just like this guy is a yeah, talent. Yeah, that's the guy that the game changer right now is um, the DN and the Cowboys, man. Parsons, uh, Parsons, yeah, Michael Parsons, man. Parsons, and that dude. I mean, you have you have they have two guys blocking him every play, like that dude just wrecks games, man. It's it's pretty yeah. impressive. And he's not even like he's kind of like a Vaughn Miller, man. I played right. with Vaughn, like he plays up, just like not he's that big, up. but just so fast, so explosive, so powerful, but not. I mean, he's not like this massive guy out there. No, and so the, it's, but it's, they're so fast for their size, and they're playing standing up. Yeah, it's it's so impressive. It's a whole different. So he's just, I mean, just wrecking defense or wrecking offenses, man. Like you've never seen. So that. uh, that's been it's been impressive watching him. All right, guys, um, I I'm happy to ask you that question because I was actually curious about that. And sometimes after a pod is done, I'm like, oh crap, I forgot that. And he doesn't even know who Michael Parsons Anyways, is. Anyways, so like... I'll give up. But I, <laughs> I don't. But I was just like, good call, out, good call, out. <laughs> call me out, dude. I bet you don't even know who Tim Couch is. Yeah, I bet you don't even know who Tim Couch. Go watch him play, man. Um, all right, guys, episode 48 in the books. Uh, thank you so much for watching, guys. I appreciate it.